Masteron, Prima Bolin, Equipoise, or Provirin, which are all known to act as reversely binding aromatized inhibitors and would keep serum estradiol levels under control. Vigorous Steve here. All right, so let me briefly explain how traditionally used medical aromatized inhibitors actually work. There's two classifications. There's the reversely binding aromatized inhibitors, which temporarily enter the aromatized enzymes and prevent aromatizable compounds like testosterone, nandrolone, trestolone, and methendianone, better known as dianabol, from converting into estradiol, 7-alpha methyl estradiol, or methyl estradiol, both of which seem to be metabolism resistant and potentiate similar or even greater affinity for the estrogen receptors as estradiol does. And once these aromatized inhibitors exit from the aromatized enzymes after a certain period of time, they are reversely binding after all, these aromatized enzymes simply continue to metabolize anabolic androgenic steroids into estrogens if that's chemically possible. And there are the suicide inhibitors which enter the aromatized enzymes, but due to their chemical structure, they get stuck and they're unable to diffuse from the aromatized enzymes, rendering them inactive all the way until these non-functional aromatized enzymes break down and are metabolized from the body. So basically, long story short, these kinds of AIs, they enter but can't exit, blocking any further aromatized activity, hence the naming suicide inhibitor. Let's go over a couple examples of reversely binding aromatized inhibitors. We have amino glutathamide, better known as cytodrine, ever so popular back in the day in the bodybuilding community, but I don't think it's available nowadays. Anastrozole arimidex, boldenone equipoise and some of its metabolites, one androstenadione, abbreviated to 1AD, Androsta Diana Dione, abbreviated to ADD, but it's probably not the ADD that some of you are diagnosed with, and dihydroboldenone, abbreviated to DHB, dihydrotestosterone, DHT, drostanolone, mastrone, and perhaps some of its metabolites, methanolone, better known as primabolin, and perhaps some of its metabolites, some of which are formed through biotransformation, but we're not entirely sure if the human body also produces these exact same metabolites, Mesrolone, provirin, and some of its metabolites potentially. Glucophage, metformin, more on this later. Letrozole, famara, tamoxifen, nolvidex, metabolite. Norendoxifen, very potent aromatized inhibitor, albeit reversely binding, as well as some of the stimulatory, psychoactive, and nootropic compounds found within tobacco products. Nicotine, anabasine, and cotinine. All of these are reversely binding aromatized inhibitors, but when it comes to the suicide inhibitors, there's not so many that are available. There's arimastane, abbreviated to ATD, also a boldenone metabolite, exemestane, aromacin used in various clinical settings, and testolactone, better known as Teslac, which is no longer available. Out of all of these options, aromacin, arimidex, arimistane, letrozole, and nolvidex are considered medical aromatized inhibitors, but if you don't want to use these, a simple way to bring the potential of aromatization of testosterone into estradiol down is reducing your body fat levels. Yes, aromatized enzymes are highly expressed within adipose tissue. So to put it simple, if you want less aromatization, get your body fat levels down because this is predominantly where the conversion occurs. And in many instances, if you bring your body fat levels down to, let's say, 8% body fat or lower, if you can stomach it, it's not easy, it's not for everybody, you probably don't need an aromatized inhibitor on testosterone replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy, or even full-blown steroid cycles, which consist of a testosterone base and perhaps a progestogenic 19 or testosterone derivative on top, like nandrolone, trenbolone, or trestolone, but doesn't include masterone, primabolin, equipoise, or provirin, which are all known to act as reversely binding aromatized inhibitors and would keep serum estradiol levels under control. Again, the dose is the poison here, so if you ramp up your exogenous testosterone and combine that with nandrolone or trestolone, then you might still get a heavy amount of aromatization and serum estradiol levels might still end up sky high, even if your body fat levels are nice and low. That being said, aromatized enzymes are also expressed in the intestinal tract. So if you take your DHEA or pregnenolone or Dianabol orally, it might be better to take that sublingually instead and bypass the aromatized enzymes which are present within the gut. 
Right? Obviously, DHA pregnenolone and Dianabol will convert into estradiol or methyl estradiol if you take them through the conventional route. And otherwise, a, a more food for thought here, if you take these orally, not only does the intestinal tract have three alpha hydroxy dehydrogenase enzymes, which already start to break down the DHA pregnenolone and Dianabol, the liver also contains cytochrome P450 enzymes, 3A4 specifically, which will further break down these hormones when taken orally, albeit that the methylation of the anabol seems to prevent this breakdown through these cytochrome P450 enzymes to a great extent. Taking these oral steroids or neurosteroids sublingually greatly bypasses its potential for aromatization. Daily subcutaneous microadministrations is also advised for your injectable aromatizable steroids for the most stable serum concentrations. Now you have to keep in mind that not all carrier oils absorb the same from the subcutaneous Injection Depot, MCT oil absorbs very rapidly and castor oil, grapeseed oil or cottonseed oil takes a couple days to absorb and release the testosterone, nandrolone or trestolone and the esters attached into systemic circulation. So you might want to go with a little bit thicker, more lengthy carrier oil that lengthens the absorption even if you do daily subcutaneous microadministrations, because this will give the most stable serum concentrations. And if you go with MCT oil or another synthetic solvent that is really easy to allow these uh, aromatizable compounds to enter systemic circulation, you still get quite significant hormonal fluctuations within the bloodstream. During these peaks, there's a temporary excess of these aromatizable steroids floating around in the bloodstream. And if they don't end up in skeletal muscle, the excess will end up in adipose tissue, where again, the aromatization will occur. Daily subcutaneous microadministrations with carrier oils, which are reasonably viscous, will prevent this to a great extent. And of course, keeping the dosages nice and moderate, low and effective, but not side effect inducing, will help a lot. Also, there are several hormonal and lifestyle factors which contribute to aromatized enzyme overexpression, even when your body fat levels are reasonably low and you do daily microadministrations, aging being one of such factors. The increase of aromatized activity during aging is mostly related to an increase in body fat levels as overall metabolic rate and activity levels come down with age not necessarily an overexpression of aromatized enzymes within the fat cells themselves. Higher body fat levels simply means more aromatized enzyme expression within adipose tissue, but men who generally keep their body fat levels under control will actually observe less aromatized enzyme expression within the fat cells, resulting in a skin thinning effect over time, as I explain in How to Thin the Skin video, which I'll link at the end of this one. Chronic hypoxia can also lead to aromatized enzyme overexpression within adipose tissue. This is not something you have to worry about if you do weekly Widowmaker sets or 100 reps on the leg press at the end of your leg day. But if you climb Mount Everest or you're a deep sea diver, then you might experience chronic hypoxia resulting in elevated serum estradiol levels, which can also lead to chronic inflammation, which is also associated with chronic hypoxia. Genetic polymorphisms and epigenetic factors can contribute. High saturated fat intake can contribute to aromatized enzyme overexpression, but it seems that healthy fat sources can actually inhibit the aromatized enzymes and lower serum estradiol levels or contribute to healthy serum estradiol levels downstream, right? More on this later on. Regular alcohol consumption can contribute partially due to the phytoestrogens that some alcoholic beverages contain. Also, more on this later, insulin resistance and obesity with chronically elevated insulin levels can all contribute to aromatized enzyme overexpression, in which case adipose tissue is, well, potato-like anyway. Inflammatory prostaglandins um, could be potentially mediated by trimbalone acetate. So, um, if you're worried about aromatized enzyme overexpression, maybe forego the trimbalone acetate if you suffer from trend cough, which can potentially induce severe uh, high levels of these inflammatory prostaglandins. Uh, chronic inflammation overall, whether that's from diet or lifestyle choices or inflammatory carrier oils, it's best to avoid all of it. Corticosteroids, whether that's endogenously produced or exogenously administered, Elevated cortisol or corticosterone levels are not good for aromatized enzyme expression within adipose tissue. And then there's polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, and hormone-sensitive cancers, but that's not something my audience has to worry about.